for having me. My name is Jason Moore. Um, I was previously at Cleveland State University where I've done the work that I showed you, um, but now at UC Davis. And um, <clears throat> I'm part of the SimPy and PyDike projects. So the motivation is, is the research that I have been doing. Uh, for the past couple of years, I've been particularly interested in deriving controllers for uh, powered prosthetics, such as this exoskeleton on the right-hand side. I uh, typically put people on a treadmill, measure all their motion and all the forces that they uh, are using to interact with the ground. I shake them around so that they get perturbed and they have to do actions that um, are uh, uh, all the different actions that you may need to stay balanced and walk. And then we take all that data and shove it into identification and learning algorithms to try to come up with control systems that may make um, these exoskeletons walk like an able-bodied person and um, have balance too. Some of the previous solutions for, uh, that we've gotten for um, the kind of methods I'm going to talk about, um, we sort of frame these optimal control problems such that we want to find what, are the, what is the optimal gait if I have a simulation model of walking. And this particular one finds the optimal trajectories of the muscles in all of our lower body that we use while walking. And once you have these kind of systems in place, I can flip the switch on gravity and try to come up see what the optimal motion may be when you're walking on the moon. And as you can see, the, the moonwalk becomes more of a skip that uh, may, may or may not mimic what uh, you see the real astronauts do when they did walk on the moon. So these tools are very powerful for uh, understanding uh, the motion of objects, in particular biomechanical systems. I'm going to jump to a simple example, though, um, and if you've seen me, I, I always talk about pendulums. I promise that was my non-pendulum thing, but I guess uh, you can also model a human as a pendulum, too. But I'm going to have two, two examples here um, that are both based off this, this uh, pendulum. The first is called trajectory optimization. It's where we're looking for trajectories of inputs to the model that are going to make it do something that we desire. And the sex and second one is parameter estimation that also can be solved with these methods. And that's where we look for um, model parameters given some measurements of real data, like I mentioned in the first slide. So a simple pendulum, these are the equations of motion. It's an ordinary differential equation. It's very simple looking. Um, it has a couple parameters, G and L. And the torque that I have there is a torque that acts at the joint that controls um, whether the um, uh, pendulum moves. So for example, I may want to ask, if I minimize the effort, how much torque that I apply, can I get the pendulum from hanging down to, to up in a, in, a minimal, in a certain time? So I have these boundary conditions that say I want to start at zero and I want to be vertical afterwards. What is the torque trajectory that will cause that? There are many, an infinite amount that will cause that, that minimizes the amount of energy that it uses to do that. So that's the first problem. The second problem is the same thing, but parameter identification. And this is uh, typically framed such that the, um, you may measure something, in this case the angle of the pendulum, of a real pendulum, and maybe I want to estimate what G and L are of that pendulum, a parameter. And so my objective function is going to minimize the least squares between the measurement, YM, and the, sim the output of my simulation. So those are two fundamental uh, objectives in this optimal control framework, one for parameter ID and one for trajectory. So typically this is done by what's called shooting. You simulate the system with different parameters and see if it matches um, or, or meets your objective, right? Simulation of systems, especially SIF systems, take a long time and they can be very computationally intensive and uh, we can run clusters of computers for weeks on the kind of problem that I showed at the beginning, the walking problem. Uh, with the traditional methods to try to maybe get at the answer. And you, pro you probably are not even going to get at the answer with a lot of methods. Uh, some, some genetic algorithms can eventually get there, but they take a lot of computation time. So um, there's other problems. You may be limited to parameterized functions instead of general nonlinear inputs to the systems. Unstable systems are very problematic. When you try to simulate an unstable system, it, it's chaotic usually for anything complex. So um, we need something that can deal with that. And then local minima are inevitable uh, in these kind of problems. You can't get away from them, so you have to come up with ways to um, tackle that, maybe a superb guess or global optimization methods. This is an example of how complex the uh, local minima issues are, right? 
I'm back to the same problem I had before. I lumped G and L together in one parameter, and if I try to identify this parameter with some measurements of the angle theta, this is what my objective looks like for various angles, for various values of P. And you can see that I have lots of local minima. And this is really the, about the simplest problem that you can almost think of. With multivariate problems, the local minima issues are, are very nasty, and you always fall, almost always fall into them. So that's a big problem, and this uh, hopefully demonstrates that. But there's some other techniques, and um, what I'm going to talk about today is solving these kind of problems with direct collocation. Direct collocation is, um, this is uh, probably, I would say, the best book by uh, John Betts to uh, get, a, get a gist of this. But it's effectively a discretization method such that you can not have to simulate your system, but still um, solve these problems and get the solutions you want. It has fast computation times, handles unstable systems well, it's less susceptible to local minima, or since you can run it so fast, you can use other techniques that you can't with slow running optimization. Um, accurate solutions require a large number of nodes and potentially lots of memory um, because there's a lot of huge sparse matrices and a lot of big sparse matrix operations that have to happen. And it's very tedious to um, reform your objective and the constraints that I'll describe in a second um, and, take, and, and find their gradients, Jacobians, and Hessians too. So those are sort of some of the issues. So we've implemented a basic direct collocation method in software. Um, it starts off with the implicit continuous equations of motion of a system. This is, uh, uh, you don't have to solve for x dot. And this is a, a really nice piece because solving for x dot for complex systems is, um, is, 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 a, is a computationally intensive problem too. This function has the states, the derivatives, the ex exogenous inputs, just like the torque that I was applying to the finium before, and potentially parameters, constant parameters with respect to time. <clears throat> we discretize these with a couple of methods. Um, I stick with first order integration rules to do the discretization. And um, this allows for a very fast computation. And then we reformulate the problem into what's called a nonlinear programming problem. And we minimize some objective j, such with um, the unknowns theta uh, that compromise all of the uh, state values at each node in the discrete time, each of the inputs in the discrete time, and all of the parameters. And the difference is, is that we now introduce constraints that say, at every node, we want Newton's laws to hold. And f, the function f is, is fundamentally saying f equals ma must hold, must hold at every time. So I've implemented this in a tool, Opti, that I call it. And it's very alpha. And you're welcome to check it out. It runs, it solves a certain set of problems already. But what this allows the user to do is think about these problems in very high level. You can write out continuous symbolic formulations of the objective, the equations of motion, um, additional constraints like boundary conditions, and, and put bounds on the, on the various free variables. And all of this is done in the continuous domain, just like the equations that I wrote at the beginning. And all of the discretization happens behind the scenes, and fast, efficient code is generated to form it into this nonlinear programming problem that I just uh, described. And, and it, uh, these, it basically gives these um, efficient functions to evaluate these large sparse Jacobians and the constraints and the objective, et cetera. And then it ships it out to various large-scale NLP solvers. Uh, in our case, I only support IP opt at the moment, uh, which is a interior point optimization that can handle thousands, millions of variables, uh, free variables. It's open source, BSD license, and of course, written in Python. Now, it's based on top of SymPy, a project that I, I uh, help with. And fundamentally, this is what the code looks like. If I had the problem from the beginning, um, I need to translate that into symbolic form. I have constants, P and T, and then functions of time. And then I write those matrices in the form there, in that uh, implicit form um, that's almost exactly like you would, you would write in math. And if you print them in the notebook, they look just like the equation at the top. <clears throat> then you give it some discretization information, number of nodes in the um, uh, discretization interval. You also can specify the objective, and, um, just like you would write it in, uh, in the math equations I had at the beginning. Uh, in this case, I'm saying I want to uh, um, minimize the sum of the square of the torques and integrate that. 
and um, or minimize the integral of the sum of the square of the torques. I can add boundary conditions. These say, you know, I want the pendulum at time zero to be down and the pendulum at time uh, at the end to be up. And I pass them to a problem object. And that's literally all it takes to form these kind of problems. The, um, <clears throat> and yeah, in this case, um, trage for trajectory op optimization, I add a known value of the parameter p, and I'm looking for the, the torque input that would get me the answer. And the second, you can also do parameter estimation. I'm a parameter, parameter identification. Uh, it would form the same thing. I would say I have some measurements of an angle theta, m, and uh, I want to find the, minimize the least squares of theta m and the simulation theta, the simulated theta. And I can pass that in, and then in this case, I give known trajectory maps. I said, in this problem, I would have no torque and, um, and uh, pass in some measured data that I could compare those with. And I can set an integration method, too. So it's a simple problem formulation. Once you have that, you provide an initial guess. Five minutes left. Okay, well, I uh, took a whole lot. I must have blabbed longer than I practiced. Five minutes is a long time. Oh, five minutes is a long time. So I'm going to... <laughs> that, that's the code. That's the code. Um, you give an initial initial guess and uh, call solve, and you get your solution. Hopefully, right? I'm going to skip the details of what's behind problem, but fundamentally, it takes those symbolic forms that are easy to write at high level, and it generates sufficient C code, wraps it immediately, and provides it back in Python so that you can have uh, very you can evaluate problems with very big big data, um, a big big uh, arrays. Um, and just to give an idea of the speed, right, if this is a 10-link system, it's a non-stiff system, for example, it has 12, 000, over 12,000 mathematical operations in the equations. If I were to simulate it for, six, for 100 seconds and sample at 100 hertz, um, I'd have a system that uh, would take about 5.6 seconds to actually simulate using a ODE integrator. If I discretize it, it has uh, 10,000 nodes, over 200,000 constraints, 14 million some entries in the Jacobian of the constraints, and 220,000 free variables. And so these are the size of problems that we can solve with, with these nonlinear programming uh, problems. Um, but to evaluate the constraint in the Jacobian, only take, it's like 50 times less than uh, simulating it once for one iteration in a traditional um, optimization routine. So, uh, and, it, and the nice thing is if, if it's a stiff problem, the timing for the integration of ODE pack goes up but the evaluation of the constraint in the Jacobian stays still, uh, stays fixed. So I'm going to give you an example. It's, um, this is a double pendulum that I want to sort of swing up to the top and um, in a finite amount of time. And so I'm going to show a little notebook briefly. If I press the right buttons. Um, I've got a notebook here that sets up this problem. Uh, these are the equations of motion that you get symbolically, um, some values for the parameters, and I pass in uh, the, the const boundary conditions and the, uh, build the problem, solve the problem, and I get an optimal solution, and then I plot to this. And so this pendulum, I basically can push a force on the base of it, and that's the only input to try to swing it up in time. And I see that uh, the top graph is force, so um, it gives it an initial 40 newtons, does some other wiggling, and the state of the pendulum goes to vertical from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and uh, then stations to become stationary at the end with uh, no velocities. And you can have a look at that a little bit later, but it's a whole lot easier. Oh, this, this screwed up my uh, visualization a little bit, but it's a whole lot easier to watch, right? If I play this, right, this is the solution it found. If I were pushing on this red box, how am I going to get the pendulum up in the most energy efficient way? And it turns out that that, that is the way, likely, right? So this is the optimal solution of swinging, swinging this pendulum um, in place to, uh, to get that thing to go up. So this can solve these problems, and that, and that only takes a minute or so, and it would take days probably in, in, in other methods. So back to the slides, and how many more minutes do I got? I'm on my 15. So I have another notebook that I'll post, and it, um, 
uh, has the parameter uh, estimation demo where I try to identify a control system for a human trying to balance under perturbations. And I'll let you guys look at that after you find my slides. I don't know how I screwed this up so bad. I practiced. <laughs> um, and let's just close that off. So I have a lightweight library that you can write high level problems in in, in SimPy. Um, translates it to these discrete formulations, solves your optimization problems way faster than a lot of methods, and um, uh, in particular, optimal control problems. And um, uh, I guess that's it, yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Yep, basically uh, anytime you move past one connected body in a multi-body system, you pretty much have a chaotic system in your hands. So it's uh, and that and a double pendulum is a chaotic system. Yes. How long is the, how much quicker is it going to be? Oh, um, for the parameter ID one that I had to skip, um, it probably, it would take, uh, I can use like a, a pretty modern genetic algorithm own parallel, own, own multiple cores, pushing out uh, multiple processes, simulating to, to try to do this for a, for, a, for a time span of, I don't know, 100 seconds of measurement. And it might, and it can, it can get there to the solution, but it might, it's going to take hours. Whereas I, can, I could run that one right now and it'll do two, two and a half seconds, right? It gives me the same solution. Yep, absolutely. So you don't, you don't uh, get away from the global minimums. I mean, the local minimum, sorry. <clears throat> it's not uh, erased. <clears throat> I've just, we've, for the problems that we're, we've been solving, it's, it seems that, um, especially for the parameter ID, because you can pass in initial condition that includes measure, potential measurements that you, you have some, you have, so, you have a better guess than nothing. And those almost always, those converge. So if I give a zero in initial guess for all the parameters that I'm after, but I provide it some of the measurement information about the motion as the initial guess, um, it'll find those parameters um, almost guaranteed no matter uh, every time. Now, if I, uh, on these trajectory optimizations, they'll get caught in local minimums. And I, and I have like a series of funny other ways it tries to get up that aren't as, aren't as minimal effort. Uh, but you can run them so fast that you, know, you, can, you, can, find, you can usually, I'll, I'll run 10 and five of them will be the lowest. And, the gl that's the global minimum, right? Quotes. <laughs> um, I was curious, uh, have you looked at all at the James Stephaners and his students work on what they call sloppy models? Don't know anything about it, no. Okay, good. Uh, well, that's my question. Thanks. Um, so, I know you mentioned that you're using SimPy and you describe your equations of motion symbolically. What are you doing to convert your symbolic equations of motion down into something that might be sort of yeah, um, yeah. Skip those things. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. Basically, SimPy gives these um, uh, objects in Python that describe exp mathematical expressions, right? And um, we have uh, code generation facilities for them too. So I can take any mathematical expression and generate code from that. And uh, we have some pretty nice pieces of the puzzle there that allow us to take these things and generate a very efficient code with common sub-expression elimination. And so I can get a nice, super fast C code and uh, to generate from these things. So it's basically just a sort of, uh, if you know NumPy ufunks, a sort of ufunkify big matrix expression operations and, um, and get those so that I can run them really fast in a, in a loop and, and shove in these, long, these um, big discretized nodes of, of data. Does that make sense? Well, that's the thing. So we're working in, um, uh, this is a symbolic tool that if you express things analytically and it's continuously differentiable, then I can handle the problem with this. I have played with automatic differentiation and um, you can, there, there are tools that exist that solve these same kind of problems that go that route instead of symbolics. So, but, but this doesn't do that. <laughs>